hello, hello. How are we doing? It's okay? I know, it's a long, long day. So let me bring this home for you. And I want to do a little bit of a wrap-up. I want to bring you together to talk a little bit about what you have experienced over the last two days and um, kind of get, give you a bit of a taste of what is in the future and like how I think about this world. And I'm calling this disruption. We're talking about disruption. We're going to talk about dystopia and we're going to talk about what the decisions are we as humans have to make. But before we get there, uh, let me share something with you. Um, Every good speech should have a cat video, so just so that I put this out. I'm not quite sure, probably you already feel like this cat, so you're like getting ready to jump with all this information, you get like all these formulas which you have learned today, you're about to get ready and you think you have it. Ah. So I hope you're not feeling quite like that. And. If you are not taking anything, uh, quite frankly, if you're not taking anything out of the last two days and, and forget all about this, which is, you know, like understandable, there's a lot of content, keep one thing in mind, that tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. And I, I hope and I, I believe that you have seen this, how this looks like. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about this um, uh, as we're going through this, this talk. And I want to uh, start off with uh, giving you a quote. Um, this is a dear friend of mine, a gentleman called Ron Shake. And Ron Shake is the founder of Panera Bread, which is a very large, healthy fast food chain in the United States. And he has a saying, which is his mantra for his people. He says that our approach has always been to discover today what matters tomorrow and then transform our company into a world that is unfolding before us. And I believe this is so true because this is what you as a leader have to do in this new world. Our role as leaders in this world is to discover today what matters tomorrow. And this is what we've done the last 48 hours. And then be ready to transform our companies into this world. And of course you heard about Ray Kurzweil's Law of Accelerating Returns. Jeffrey Rogers um, did this in his opening remarks. So we'll spare you the details, but you re remember that most technology systems move and evolutionary systems move on this exponential curve. And um, Jeffrey already showed you this. This is exponential growth we see in um, population. Just as a quick reminder, the thing which is really remarkable here, and this is the most important thing to understand, is that not just individual technologies move on this exponential curve, like for example computing with Moore's law, but what happens is that they stack on top of each other. One enables more breakthroughs in others. And this is the reason why this curve looks the way it looks. This is the reason why we grew our population to 7.4 billion people on this planet and still have room to grow. It's also the reason why Ray Kurzweil makes this interesting statement where he says, the change we're seeing in the next 100 years equals the change we've seen in the last 20,000 years. Let that sink in for a second. Like the And this is not just figuratively, this is literally speaking, the change we're seeing in the next 100 years will be bigger, equal or bigger than the change we saw in the last 20,000 years. Let me make this utterly clear to you. Do you remember this guy? Of course, right? This is Marty McFly. And if you remember, uh, you know, like this is, I'm dating myself here, um, but this came out in like 1984, 1985. And, uh, you know, we all wanted to be like Marty. But imagine Marty. Like, take this guy here and bring him to today. Like, this is 1985. Like, he didn't have the internet. He didn't have smartphones. He didn't know about electric vehicles. He didn't know anything about genetics. The genome wasn't decoded then. Right? We had no idea about all these things. Like, a massive amount of change has happened since then. Uh, as a German, the Berlin Wall fell. Like when he grew up, there was still like, you know, Russia and the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. And this was the car he was driving, of course. And today he would sit in this car. And here's, here's how this looks like. This gentleman on the left is Marty McFly in the future. This is all of us sitting in a car in the future and this is how the future will look to us. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like it's not like just, Boy, that's Th perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random, like, what's the future? Because the car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have 
you know, like an insane mode, right? That makes sense. So you just come to like a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it, you just jam Oh, on. shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh. 70 miles an hour. Brooks, oh, <laughs> shit. Yo, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. <laughs> like, you gotta give people fair warning. Why? Like, you can't fucking just say, Yeah, you can. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. No, <laughs> <you're good. laughs> so this is us, and this is the future happening to us. There's this idea of what we call the Gutenberg moment, right? Gutenberg invents the Gutenberg press, and we change the way we think about information. Ford invents the Model T, and we change the way we think about transportation. Thomas Edison invents the light bulb, and suddenly darkness turns into light. These moments happen, but they happen far between. They take decades, some, sometimes centuries to happen. And we're moving into a world where we have a Gutenberg moment literally every year. This is the crazy world we're moving into. And when you look at this crazy world, and just as a reminder, and this has been said by many, many different people, this is um, Bill Gates, what we do tend to do is we underestimate, we overestimate the change which happens in the next two years, and we underestimate the change which happens in the next 10. What this means is that we look at the technology, we want it to be better, we are super excited about it, and VR is going to change everything next year, and it's not happening. But 10 years later, VR has changed everything. So keep this in mind as you're going through this world today, and keep in mind that this world moves on this exponential curve. Now, this is Alan Watts. He's a philosopher who said that the only way to make sense of this change is to join the dance. And I want to join the dance with you, and I want to talk about disruption. Because some interesting things happen in this world, and this is, um, I, I want to present to you two pieces of, of research we've been doing over the last year and a half to two years. Um, none of this has been publicly presented, so you're like one of the first people to see this. And here's what happens. The first question I'm asking myself as a business person is, we're moving into a world of abundance. We talked about this a little bit over the last two days. We're moving into a world where we change our perception from scarcity to abundance, and that shifts, fundamentally shifts, the way we live our lives and the way we run our businesses. Let me give you an example. This here is what we call a scarce resource. This is a record. A record is made out of plastic. A plastic ultimately is oil. To produce this record, you need to pay money. It costs you money. It costs you about $7 to produce one of those records. To ship that record from me to you costs me money because I need to go to the post office and they ship it to you. For you to store that record costs you money. All these factors go away the moment I turn this into a digital good. The moment I turn this into an MP3 or a streamed item, now suddenly something fundamentally shifts. The fundamental properties of these items change. The cost of creation, the cost of duplication, distribution, and storage go down to zero. It cost me nothing to make a copy of this, or very close to nothing. It cost me nothing to send that copy to you, and it cost you nothing to store that copy, which means that the business models fundamentally shift. Now, here's an interesting thing which also happens, which is you take the good old compass, which is a way for us to find our way. And we make this a little bit better by adding information to it. So now we're creating a map. But this map still has the old properties, right? It cost me money to make a copy of it. It cost me money to get that to you, etc. Now, I turn it into a digital map. And those copy, those properties change. But something else happens. Because now it's digital, it adds features. It adds features because now I can do route, routing on this map. And the features it adds is now I can make changes to this map very easily. I can send you a new version of the map overnight without you like knowing it. I can connect these maps to each other. I know exactly where each car is which is using the map and see what the traffic patterns are. I can make this measurable. I can measure this exactly. I can see how much you use the map and how, uh, where your car is and can do so using software. I can programmatically do this, which means that the features go up into infinity. And this changes the way we think of our businesses dramatically because the question for me becomes, in a world of abundance, how do you make money? How do you make money in a world where all this stuff becomes abundantly available? And our research indicates that there's only two ways, broadly speaking, 
how you can make money in this world. And the worst one, first one is this. In a world of abundance, you can create uniqueness, rareness, artificially. And I show you four ways you can create uniqueness today. The first one is this here. There is absolutely no reason that a Louis Vuitton handbag should be $4,000. Now, my wife disagrees with me on this, of course. But if you look at a Louis Vuitton handbag and you compare it to a nicely made $300 leather handbag, they're no different. You compare it feature by feature to a plastic bag, which is 10 cents, no difference. But of course you pay $4,000 for it because brands matter. I pay for brands because I want to be part of the Louis Vuitton club. Of course. Here's the second one. Now, granted, and you're very lucky, I just heard you opened your first Starbucks. The devil is in this country, just saying. But if you have traveled outside of Italy, you know these guys, right? And these guys charge you five bucks for a cup of coffee, which is insane but we're still happy to pay five bucks for a cup of coffee at Starbucks because what they create is social connection. Starbucks mantra is we are the third place. There's home, there's work, and there's Starbucks. So social, social interactions is we pay for that, we love it, we want it, and thus we pay five bucks for a cup of coffee. And of course, I hope Starbucks is not successful in Italy. If you've ever been to an Apple store, what's remarkable about an Apple store is they're effectively empty. Apple probably pays, uh, sells you 500 products. And all these products you can buy in any other electronics store. If you go into a good electronics store, you can buy any of these products. But Apple to this day is the highest grossing chain store in the world by a very large margin. They sell you more stuff than any other store on a per square foot basis than any other store in the world, which is crazy. But what Apple has created is an experience. You walk into the Apple store and the Apple store is a temple. It's glass and steel and wood. And they don't have people who sell you stuff. They've got geniuses. And you don't go to a cash register to pay for it. The people are like there with their phones and they just charge you wherever you are. So you create an experience. And the last one is this here. I was recently in Berlin, and I walk into a pop-up store from Adidas. They scan my feet, and about 90 minutes later, I walk out of the store with a 3D printed pair of shoes, which fits perfectly to my feet. We're moving into a world where personalization becomes a thing. Now, of course, in the digital world, we have this forever. Your Facebook looks different than my Facebook. Your Google looks different than my Google. In the physical world, it's still really hard. We talked about 3D printing today, but we're getting there. Slowly but surely, we're getting to a world where we create pr products which are made for you individually. And those you pay for, of course. So this is number one. And then there's a second one. The second one is, if you're in a world of abundance, embrace abundance and become the platform. When you think about platforms, there's three important pieces around platforms. The first one is this. The reason why Amazon was successful in the beginning is the fact that Amazon gave me access to one million books, where every other bookstore gave me access to about 40, 30 to 50,000. So what they do is they provide me access. They give me access to this ocean of products. If you remember buying software until very recently, until about a year or two years ago, the way you bought software was you walked into a store, you bought one of these boxes, uh, you walked with the box, you walked home, you opened the box, you pull out the CD, you put the CD in your computer, you try to install the software, you realize that the CD is scratched, you need to put it back in the box, you go back into the store. Today, we make this incredibly easy because what you do today is you click and 20 seconds later, the software is on your computer. This is the iOS store, the macOS store, the Windows store. That's the way we sell software today. They be have become platforms. Here's an interesting tidbit, by the way. I just did some research on platform business models. The iOS economy, so both iPhones and everything which is being sold in the store, 
by 2019 will be 500 billion US dollars, half a trillion US dollars. That is more than the GDP of Argentina. So this is how powerful these platforms are. And the last one is this here. Anyone here is using um, Spotify or Apple Music or any of these other streaming services? Great. So I use them as well. I I'm a, a Spotify user. And I, let me tell you one thing. Spotify is useless for a simple reason. Spotify gives me access to 120 million songs. I remember 50 to 100, probably. So if Spotify wouldn't do something very clever, I would listen to the same 50 to 100 songs all day long. But what they do is, and this is really important, they curate. They create, provide curation. And curation is this magic thing. Because curation allows me to sit at home, and this is a true story. I was with my wife, and we were cooking, cooking Mexican dinner. And I go on Spotify, and I type in Mexican dinner playlist. And of course there's a Mexican dinner playlist. And we end up listening to mariachi music for two hours from artists I have never heard before and songs I've never heard before, but they curated this playlist for me. So this is the power of these systems. And here's the challenge. Most businesses today find themselves at the tension between these two things. They're in the middle. And I believe the businesses of the future need to choose. And by the way, you can also do both. Some businesses can do both. Amazon embraces abundance and at the same time creates uniqueness. Like your Amazon looks different than my Amazon. Your Amazon playlist is different than mine. But this is the future of businesses. So this becomes deeply disruptive. And talking about disruption, I want to clean up with a, a notion about disruption. Because we've been using a formula for disruption for a really long time, which comes out of this book. This book is called The Innovator's Dilemma. It was written by uh, Clayton Christensen. And it's a phenomenal book. It came out about 25 years ago. And Clayton was the first person to develop a model for how disruption looks like. And the model is very powerful, and I want to show you the model if you haven't seen it. Before we get there, though, I want to talk about one important distinction, which is the difference between innovation and disruption. Innovation is doing the same things, but doing them better. Right? So you make toothpaste, and your new version of the toothpaste is toothpaste super. And then you do toothpaste super white, and then it becomes toothpaste super, super white. That is innovation. Every once in a while, we do new things, but they haven't yet become disruptive. So you, instead of doing toothpaste, you do a mouthwash which cleans my teeth. Not quite disruptive yet, because only when we do new things which make the old things obsolete, do we create disruption. So here's Clayton's model. Clayton's model is very simple. He says, when you look at a product category, there's time and there's performance. And performance means like something you care about in a product. Let's say, for example, in a car, your um, uh, petrol consumption per 100 kilometers. And there's something called the customer need line. The customer need line is like the line where, where the product is good enough. So you say, it needs to be here. If it hits that line, I'm good enough. And then Clayton's insight was this. There is something called an incumbent. This is the old, the existing company. And the old existing company, somewhere down in the line in the past, created a product which was good enough. And then what they do is they do innovation, driven by the customer, because the customer says, what's new? And then every year, you make a new product, and it gets a little bit better and better and better and better. And the assumption until Clayton was that if you come into a market, you need to make a product which is better than what is in the market. And that's not true. Because what Clayton found is that when you find someone who disrupts the market, who creates something which makes the old thing obsolete, in the beginning, the product is crap. It's not good. But a few people will buy it because it has specific properties they like. And then it gets better and better and better. And the moment it hits the good enough line, it becomes deeply disruptive. Let me show you how this looks like in the real world. So when I was 16, I started shaving. Or when I was 15, I started shaving. And because I thought I need to be a man, I shaved with the first razor. This is a single blade razor. 
And for all the men in the audience who have tried this, you know this, this, this ends in blood. Right? <laughs> so, this was clearly not good enough yet, right, in our line. But it got better when we did this. Still a single blade razor, but now it's what is called a safety razor. So I can actually shave without, like, you know, stripping off my whole face. And then we go on a line of, um, of innovation, right? Like you make us better. So we create a two-blade razor, and then we do a three-blade razor, and a four-blade razor, and then we create a seven-blade razor, God knows why, and then we create a 40-hundred-blade razor. <laughs> so this is innovation as we know it. And then something interesting happens. Like a guy launches this company. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So this guy comes out, brings out this product called Dollar Shave Club, which is objectively a worse product. It only has two blades, but two blades is good enough. And because it only has two blades, and because he innovates on the business model, because his innovation is to say, I don't make you go into a store and pay lots of money for these things. What I'm going to do is I ship them to your house for free, and you only pay a little money for the, for the blades because you only have two blades. They're much cheaper to manufacture. So this thing becomes a sensation, so much so that Unilever is forced to buy them for one billion US dollars in cash. This is disruption. Now here's the interesting thing about this thing. We use this model, and it's a really good model. Don't make me, like, this is a really solid model. It's the only model we have for a long time for disruption. But the problem is we use this model, in the US we have a saying, which is, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, which means, if you have a model, you try to use it everywhere. And I think that's a mistake, because we did a bunch of research into figuring out what are the disruptive forces? Why do companies become disrupted? And we found three main forces. The first one is this. Disruption is never one feature. I explain this to you in a minute, but keep this in mind. So disruption is not the smartphone. The smartphone is not one feature. The smartphone is a PC-powered microprocessor. It is better batteries. It is a touchscreen device. It is a different form factor. It's a little bit bigger than a normal like telephone. It is a touchscreen. It is software. It's all these things combined. It is not a single thing. So this is important to understand. I'll show you later why. The second one is, and this is really important, and I had this conversation over dinner with, uh, with some friends. Your existing skills and processes are no longer relevant, and that's really dangerous if you're in a big company. Because you have built up skills and processes, and you have people who are defending them with their life, and they become irrelevant. And the, last, the third one is this one, and this is the last one. Disruption always, always happens at the go-to market. It's a mi common misunderstanding that people think disruption happens in the lab or in the innovation group. It happens when you actually bring the product to market. Let me show you how this looks like in the real world. Let's take this because we all understand it. Telephones. Probably when we were at the second from the left, this is Nokia, when we were at the second from the left, 
we were at the good enough line, right? This was a good telephone, like probably some of you remember this. I had this. You've got about a week's worth of, of battery life. You can talk with it. Talk quality is great. You can send text. It's fantastic. And then we go on to what is called a, a sustaining innovation line. So we make the telephone a little bit better and better and better. In March 2008, 2007, this telephone comes out. This is a Nokia N95. I bought this thing. This is the best phone you possibly can buy. Cost me 600 US dollars. Has two cameras, two cameras. Has like a, a two week battery life. Two weeks. And you can like text with it and it's beautiful and it's tiny. I love this device. Until three months later, this comes out. Now, again, this is like, it's easy to look at this and say, of course, it disrupted the market. But it's important to understand that this thing became disruptive because it did three things at the same time, right? It is not just one feature. It makes old skills obsolete. And it hit the market at the go-to-market strategy. So much so that here's an interesting clip. It's a little bit of bad quality. It's the best clip I could find. This is Steve Barmer, the guy who used to run Microsoft. When the iPhone comes out, he gets, get in, gets interviewed, and he does makes this comment. Oops, sorry. This comment. Steve, let me ask you about uh, the iPhone and the Zoom, if, if I may. The Zoom uh, was getting some traction, and Steve Jobs goes to Macworld, and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. He's right. Here's the thing, right? So you look at this and you're like, oh, Steve Barmer's an idiot. No, he's right. He's 100% right. Because you see what he says? He says $600, $500 for a, for a phone? The mistake he's making is the iPhone is not a phone. The iPhone is this, just in a smaller form factor. The iPhone is not a phone. The iPhone is a computer. It's a very different thing. And for a computer, I happily pay $500 because I can now put the computer in my pocket. Right? So it leads to an interesting world because we love to look at these guys here and say they didn't get it, they're idiots. Well. Not so fast. We had a lot of Nokia executives, former Nokia executives, in our program at Singularity University. And I was super curious. I was, I was going to them and was like, why didn't you see it? What happened? And they told me the story. And it's really interesting. Because the story is the following. First of all, they said, everyone in our company saw the disruption coming. But what they saw was, they saw the individual pieces. So the guy who is responsible for the microprocessor, he knew that these new microprocessors were coming. And the guy who was responsible for the, the touchscreen displays knew that the touchscreen displays were coming. And the guy who was responsible for the software saw that software is changing. But what they didn't do is they didn't put it together. Right? Disruption is never one thing. And then the second thing which happened is all their skills were in, soft, were in doing hardware, they built phones. The iPhone is not about the hardware, it's about the software. And here's an interesting insight. Three days after Apple announced the iPhone, Nokia launched, this, like, launched a video for a new device which looks like this. Nokia devices will allow you to touch the screen to navigate. Browsing your content couldn't be easier. Nokia allows you to share all of your content in many different ways. Uploading your photos to Flickr, for example, couldn't be simpler. All these experiences, so elegantly simple. It's what Nokia always has and always will deliver. So Nokia had the iPhone. One of the engineers at Nokia told me this interesting story. Nokia takes four model generations to get it right. Four. This here was model generation number three. And then something happened. Nokia got a new CEO, Stephen Elop. And Stephen does the thing which 
which a finance guy does. He looks at the balance sheet and the P&L, the profit and loss statement. And what he does is he says, whoa, we're making a billion dollars with these normal telephones, and we're making zero dollars with this thing here, and it's not even ready, so let's, ki let's kill it. This is Stephen Elop um, in, a, in a show. The Stephen Elop is the guy on the right, where the host, the moderator, asks him about the iPhone. He says, like, hey, when is the new Nokia phone coming out? Because I have an iPhone. I want to have the no new Nokia phone. Look at his dismissive behavior. I have an iPhone. Oh, how embarrassing. I, I don't want to have an <laughs> iPhone. I want to, I want to, <laughs> Look, I want to I have a I can take Nokia. care of that for you yeah. right here. There you I, go. I want <laughs> to have a Nokia phone. It's gone. <laughs> I want to have a Nokia phone. He just didn't see it. All he could see was his profit and loss statement. Afterwards, he said this, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. Yeah, of course he didn't do anything wrong, because what you didn't do is, you didn't look. You didn't put the pieces together, and all your skills, you didn't realize that all your skills are in the wrong area, and you didn't realize that the, the disruption came at the go-to market. Scott Cook, he's the founder of Intuit, is probably one of the smartest CEOs I know in the world, said that success is a powerful thing because it makes companies stupid and they become less and less innovative. Nokia was too successful. Kodak was too successful. Every this company which gets disrupted is typically too successful. And they have the skills in the wrong places and they don't see the whole picture. So keep this in mind. This is disruption happens in three distinct pieces. It is never one singular feature. It happens when like, your skills and processes become irrelevant and it happens at the go-to market. The good news is this. It is not complicated. If anyone tells you like it's complicated, they only want to sell you their consulting services. I don't do that, so let me tell you it's not complicated. But make no mistake, it is hard. It is hard as hell and it is pretty complex but it's not complicated per se. If you went to business school, you have heard of the four Ps, and the four Ps is not Pascal, 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 Pascal. The four Ps is uh, product, price, promotion, and place. This is the magic formula of how you build particular consumer product. This is where disruption happens. The disruption happens at these four places, at the four Ps. Disruption also tends to be what we call chaotic. You cannot spreadsheet your way through disruption. Disruption is this weird, chaotic thing, which means there is some order in it, but it's largely chaos. So you need to create skills in your company to be okay with this, to leverage these ideas, to figure out what happens in this world. And let me end with something, which is, uh, this is uh, Andy Grove, the guy who founded Intel, said, only the paranoid survive. I think that's a very important point here. Because that's how these things work. Now, with that being said, all this comes down to the human. It always comes down to the human. Right? It is people. At the end of the day, it is always people. Which brings me to my second point, which is the idea, what happens in this world? What is the dystopian version of the world we're seeing? Because I'm German, I have to think about these things. So if you look at the world as it stands today, and you look at technology, so for example, social. Social media allowed us to do the Arab Revolution. It upended a regime. This is an incredibly powerful outcome. And at the same time, we can use the very same technology to create what we have in China now, which is this social scoring system, which is a lot like a credit score. And it leads to really weird outcomes. Um, as described in this short clip here. When Liu Hu recently tried to book a flight, he was told he was banned from flying because he's on the list of untrustworthy people. Liu was a journalist who was ordered by a court to apologize for a series of tweets he wrote and was then told his apology was insincere. I can't buy property. My child can't go to private school, he says. You feel you're being controlled by the list all the time. And the list is now getting longer, as every Chinese citizen is being assigned a social credit score, a fluctuating rating based on a range of behaviors. It's believed that community service and buying Chinese-made products can raise your score. Fraud, tax evasion, and smoking in non-smoking areas can drop it. This is pretty crazy. So crazy so that there's a high-speed train in China 
And you're only allowed to use the high-speed train if your credit score, if your social score is high enough. In a three-month period, they rejected four million rides on this train because their social score isn't high enough. This is a weird outcome. This is a very disturbing view of the world. Let me show you something else. We talked about AI today. So you can use AI like IBM Watson to detect um, cancers on CT and MRI scans better than any human, which is incredible. Uh, you can use AI to play the game of Go, which is the most complex board game humans have ever invented, and beat humans in four out of five championship matches after only six months of training. You can feed art into an AI, and the AI generates new art. Now, I also believe they fed some LSD into this AI, but that's a different story. And then you can do some really weird stuff. Have you heard of the story of Microsoft Tay? Tay was a chatbot, came out a couple years ago. And the way Tay works is, Tay is a Twitter chatbot. So you send a message to, uh, to Tay, Tay responds in the style of a 19-year-old, and then you just keep talking, which is kind of cool, right? Like, not creepy at all that I talk to a 19-year-old as a 45-year-old man, but like, whatever. So I just keep talking with this thing, and Tay's magic power is an AI in the back end. And this AI has a learning model where from every tweet it receives, it starts to learn. So it gets better and better and better. Microsoft said, the more you chat with Tay, the smarter she gets. This is the future. That's incredible. And it started out really nice. Like, this is her first tweet. It's like, hello world. And then she says, can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool. So cute. But here's the thing, Tay tweets with internet people. Internet people are the worst. If you've ever been on the internet, internet people are the worst, they're terrible. Internet people do stuff like they go on sites and ask, how much Listerine do I need to get drunk? Listerine is a, a mouthwash, right? They believe the earth is flat. They believe that Hitler is still alive because he's, he is in Argentina, like escaped on a submarine. This is true internet stuff. So these people start to chat with Tay. And what could possibly go wrong? Nothing, of course. Well, Tay starts to learn. And see, she starts to learn very, very fast. Within hours, Tay starts to say, I effing hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell. That's not quite nice, right? Then she goes on and says, like, Hitler was right, I hate the Jews. This is pretty terrible. And then, like, someone points it out to her and says, like, hey, you're racist. And she's like, no, no, chill, I'm a nice person. I just hate everybody. Like, these are our, as, like, our AI overlords, right? So uh, Microsoft was forced to take the AI, uh, the, this AI down within 16 hours. It took the internet 16 hours to teach Tay the worst behavior of any human. 16 hours. Now, you can laugh about this and say, yeah, whatever, it's a chatbot. But here's the thing. What Tay is, is an AI. And these AI are black boxes. We can't look into those. And we start to put very interesting decisions into the hands of AIs. We now let AIs think about if, if you happen to be in a coma, if you should live or die. I am not sure if that's the outcome we want to have in the world. Right? It's a really interesting world. Here's another one, genetics. You heard earlier about the incredible power of genetics. Uh, this is a company out of our portfolio. They're called Miraculous. What they're doing is they take a DNA test, a, a blood test, and they can find in your blood RNA, uh, which is transcribes DNA into proteins. And what, this, what they can find is they can find cancers pre-stage 1 earlier than any other test on the planet. This test costs $200, takes like 20 minutes, changes the way we think about cancer detection. It's incredible. It changes the way we live our lives. But then you can also do weird things with AI. This is a friend of mine, a woman called Heather Dewey Hogboard. She comes out of New York, and she's an artist. And she has a really interesting art project about AI, which I want her to talk about. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York.
York artist Heather Dewey Hagford. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? Let me unpack this for you. This is a little weird. What she does is she's literally picking up cigarette butts on the street of New York. On a cigarette butt is your saliva. In your saliva is your DNA. She extracts that DNA using a technique the FBI has mastered 30 years ago. If you're watching CSI on television, that's the thing. And she re then she uh, sequences this DNA and reconstructs with a um, advanced genetics testing lab, reconstructs your facial features because, of course, your facial features are encoded in your DNA. The shape of your skull, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes. And she puts it into a 3D model and prints these 3D masks without ever having seen you. Here's the interesting thing about this. I talk to a lot of politicians all around the world, and I show them this video for a simple reason. A, to freak them out, of course. B, there is not a single country in the world where this is currently illegal. This is completely legal here in Italy. It's completely legal in the US. It's completely legal in Germany. More importantly, we don't even talk about this. We don't even have the moral and the ethical discussion about this. We don't even know if that's OK or not. If you are drinking out of one of these plastic bottles we have here, and you throw that bottle away, I can take your DNA, sequence this DNA, and can tell you afterwards what your chance of getting Alzheimer's is. So I see a whole bunch of you just like, just dropped your plastic bottle. It's like, nope, nope, it's all good. This is crazy. And then, of course, it goes to humans, right? It all comes down to humans. Kids in school in the US are taking a drug which was made for people with ADHD, attention deficit disorder, to become more focused. This is a drug called Adderall. They're becoming superhuman. They're tuning their brains by taking chemicals. We're starting to see a world where we have people who will enhance themselves and those who will be left behind, right? Both in terms of drug use, in terms of augmenting their brains, in terms of, you know, creating superhumans. If you watch the movie Elysium, this is like, this is the idea, like we, we bifurcate as a species. But make no mistake, we're already doing this, and we're doing it in incredibly powerful ways. This video here is of a uh, person, a, a young woman, she's in her 20s. She could never hear. She has basically no eardrums. And we implanted a little drought into her brain and make her hear. This is not a hearing aid. This is literally make her a cyborg. We connect her brain to a computer, and that computer makes her hear for the first time in her life. And this is how this looks like. Oh, that moves. <laughs> it's like so close. <laughs> Technically, your device is on. <laughs> Can you yeah. tell? Oh, that's exciting. Here, you can put it down for a second. Just get used to the sound. <laughs> what does it sound like? <laughs> oh, mommy, you're messed up, guy. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear your voice? Does your voice sound pretty loud? Um, no, not really. Well, that's good. <laughs> My laughter sounds loud. Yeah, you'll get used to all of that over time. <laughs> Do you want to hear your husband say something? Which brings me to my last point. What are the decisions we are taking? 
for the first time in human history, we as people, as individuals, become as powerful as companies, large companies, and even nation states. This has never been achieved before. We as people become godlike. We as people become so powerful that we have the powers of a god. And the question I'm asking myself over and over and over again is what do we as people do with these powers? What do we choose to do with these new powers? What do we use these powers for? And of course, you look at the statistics, and all the statistics in the world show us that all the important things get better. There's more people get educated. There's less people dying. There's uh, you know more people like less people in poverty. Every single statistic points to the right direction. I want to introduce you to a few of my friends, and I want to tell you a few stories. This is a gentleman called Mark Moore. He's a very dear friend of mine, and Mark's work is in Africa. And it's probably the most important work I know of in the world. Because what Mark does is, and I went with him to Africa to see this myself. What Mark does is, he cares about these children. In this world, as of today, in this world, there's a child which dies every eight seconds of malnutrition. There's about 3.1 million children every single year who die because they do not get enough food enough calories. This is a world, by the way, where we have 125% calorie surplus. There's 25% more calories on this planet than we would need to feed every single human being on this planet. And of course, it's a hard problem to solve. In the same eight seconds, just to give you a reference, McDonald's sells you 600 hamburgers. Anyone here likes peanut butter? I know it's a weird question. It's like the Americans love that stuff. But I'm curious, like anyone loves peanut butter? I've got peanut butter for you. You want to try? See if you can catch it. OK, anyone else? I can't throw all the, way all the way to the back. There you go. Anyone else? Peanut butter. Here you go. Perfect. Good catch. That peanut butter is a product Mark produces. This product is not technically peanut butter, it's called RUTF, a ready-made therapeutic food. This is peanut butter fortified with a little bit of uh, vitamins and minerals. It was invented by Doctors Without Borders about 30 years, 25 years ago, and it's called the miracle drug. Because you give this to a child three packets a day, by the way, it's really tasty. You give this to a child three packets a day, and the child survives 100%. Every single chi child which gets this as nutrition survives 100%. Mark, my friend, is the guy who makes these things. And he's attributed with the fact that he brought down the cost of these things by more than 60%. And I'm asking, I asked him an interesting question. So I was with him in Africa, and I saw this, this truly heartbreaking thing happen. And I saw these children being nurtured back to life using his product. And I asked him an interesting thing. I said, this must be incredibly hard to solve. Because there's still 3.1 million children dying, a child dying every eight seconds because of malnutrition. And we have this, this miracle drug, but it must be super expensive to solve. And Mark looked at me and he said, we did the math over and over and over again, and the math comes, always comes out to one billion US dollars. It costs us one billion US dollars a year to make sure that there is not a single child on this planet which dies of malnutrition. And then I started thinking about this, and I was like, a billion dollars is of course not a big number. I was like, what else do we do with a billion dollars? And it turns out that most sports team, professional sports team, like the Yankees, their annual budget is one billion US dollars. And now I'm asking myself the question, who are we as people when we choose to let children die instead want to see a sports team play? Nothing against sports, I'm a big sports fan, but it's an interesting question I think we have to ponder. I don't think that there are statistics, and I don't think that there is side effects or unintended consequences. This is what Mark taught me. You look at a statistic and you can be hide behind it. You can say it's getting better. 
But when you're in Africa and you see a child die because of malnutrition, you know that we have to do something. Let me introduce you to my second friend. This is Nithya Ramamata. She runs a company called Nextleaf Analytics. And what Nithya does is incredible. So she came to me when I was at Google.org, and she tackles a really big problem. The problem is that 25% of vaccines in the developing country um, spoil because of a break in the cold chain. They get too warm or too cold, and then they're ineffective. What this means is that millions of children go unvaccinated. In the worst cases, by the way, we administer vaccines which make the child sick instead of protecting it. When I met Nithya, I was at Google.org, and she showed me this device. And I was like, okay, what is that? So she opened it up for me, and inside of this device, you'll find a $25 Chinese manufactured smartphone, a little bit of, like, a tiny little bit of her own hardware which she developed, and the temperature sensor. You put this whole thing onto the fridge, it now travels with the fridge, and it measures continuously the temperature in the fridge. And because this is a smartphone, it does a couple things. The first is, it sends the nurse in the field a text message to let the nurse know if the fridge was compromised. The second one is, it sends the data up into the cloud to let the health authorities know if the fridge was compromised and where, because these things happen at the same places. So I meet Nithya, and Nithya gives me, a I see her, and I'm, I'm, I'm at google.org, so we give philanthropic grants to companies. And I asked her simply, I said, like, so where are you with this product? She says, like, this is my product, it works. And I went to the Gates Foundation. I was like, that's great. And if you know anything about this world, like, the Gates Foundation is the big guy. And I asked her, so what did the Gates Foundation say? They said, she said to me, they gave me a check. I was like, that's great, that's amazing. How much did, did they give you? And she said, they gave me an empty check and said, write on the check what you want. If you know anything about the Gates Foundation, that never happens. So I look at him and it's like, in disbelief, I look at her and it's like, Nithya, what did you write on the check? And she says, I want to write $420,000. And I'm like, why do you want to write $420,000? And she's like, well, we want to go into one more country and we want to try it out and get more data. And I look at her and I'm like, you're crazy. You hold in your hands the solution to the problem. You hold in your hands the thing which will make the problem go away. And she says, okay, I think about it. Calls me back a day later and says, I wrote on the check $2 million. And I want you to write me a check for $1 million. And I say, of course. So I'm incredibly proud to say that since then, she is in six African countries and all of India, in all of these countries, she's in more than 50% of the fridges, in all of these countries, the problem is gone. It does not exist anymore. And the reason why I tell you the story is twofold. The first one is this. This device there, you can build. This is not rocket science. You can build this, anyone can build this. And if you can't build it, you know someone who can. We just need to make the decision that we want. And the second thing Nithya taught me is this. She taught me to ask the simple question, which is, what does it take to make the problem go away? Because we have the powers to make problem disappear today. You heard Steve Jobs say, you may make a dent in the universe. I don't give a shit about making dents in the universe anymore because we have the powers to make the problems go away. Let me tell you a last story. This is a dear friend of mine, Mike Smith. Mike is a skater. You know the people we don't want to have in the cities? And when I first mo met Mike, I met him like he looked like this. And I'm like, you know, what do you do? And he's like, well, I run this interesting organization. And I ask him, so what, tell me a story. And he tells me his story. When he was a teenager, he was a skater, and he played um, uh, football, American football. And his coach, like he was with his coach, and he lives in Nebraska. Nebraska is kind of in the middle of nowhere in the US. It's very cold in the winters. And this is in the winter. And he asks his coach, his um, uh, football coach, he says, hey coach, I want to do something good in the world. What shall I do? And the coach was driving him home. And halfway on the way home, five miles away from his house, the coach opens the door and says, get out of the car. And Mike is like, what do, you, what do you mean, get out, it's cold. He's like, no, get out of the car. 
And what I want you to do is, I want you to, they were on a bridge. I said, I want you to go down to the bridge and down there you'll find the homeless people of, ne of this town. And you talk to them and you figure out how you can help them. So he went down and he spoke to the homeless people and the homeless people told him, what we need is socks because it's cold and our feet are freezing. And Mike takes a skateboard and skates back five miles back to his school and steals all the socks from the soccer team, puts them into his backpack and skates back to the homeless people and hands out the socks. And then he decides to make this a profession. So he starts a thing called Skate for Change. So he asks other skaters to do the same thing. By the way, remember, skaters are the people we don't want to have in our cities. They're dirty and loud, just so you know. So he does this, and now there's hundreds, hundreds of these Skate for Change centers all around the world. These are skaters, teenagers who skate around the world. And then he doesn't stop there but he builds the second largest skate park in Lincoln, Nebraska to get the kids in Lincoln, Nebraska off the street. And then he doesn't stop there because then he builds the biggest food pantry in the, in the state inside of his skate park. And then he doesn't stop there, then he starts traveling around the United States and talks to teenagers about bullying and self-worth and self-esteem. And here's the real part of the story. When I meet Mike, Mike, looks like this. He's this larger than life guy. He's got like a million YouTube followers. And I'm like, I look at him and I'm like, you know what? You're full of shit. I don't get it. I don't buy it. I think you're just like, your ego is huge. And then I find myself six months after I first met him, I find myself with him and a couple of his friends at a leadership retreat. And at the leadership retreat, a friend of mine tells me this story. He says, Hey, do you know Joe? I'm like, who's Joe? He's like, well, Joe. I'm like, I don't know who Joe is. Who's Joe? And then he tells me that in Mike's town is a, a, a kid, he's a 30 years old, who has a mental disorder. And uh, he needs to be taken care of all the time. And Mike became his friend. The mother of that Joe had to go to, um, uh, to a rehab for drugs. And they were threatening to take away Joe's um, right to live there and wanted to put him into a mental health clinic. And what Mike does is, remember, this guy is in his 20s and he's a skater. What Mike does is, he goes and becomes the legal guardian. He becomes Joe's legal dad to make sure that Joe doesn't need to go to a clinic. And now has Joe living with him. And what Mike taught me is a very simple lesson. The lesson Mike, I learned from Mike is that sometimes it is the people no one imagines anything of who do the things no one can imagine. This is really important. So the question for me becomes like, what is the, what is the potential of a child? The potential of a child is limitless. And then we build these barriers around us and we, we talk ourselves into we cannot do it or it's too complicated, or it's too hard. Children do not have that. We should stop asking why, and we should ask the question, why not? And who are we, and what are we going to do? Let me end on this note. I believe to live your life on purpose is a radical act, and it is probably the most important thing you can do. I have the great pleasure of, of um, moderating the Singularity U executive program, and. A couple years ago, it's a week-long program. I had this interesting insight. I'm with 80 leaders from all around the world, and they spent a whole week with us. And they came to this conclusion. I said, like, wow, like, if I think about my life, any life, this here is your life. Each of those dots is one week. You only have about 4,000 of those dots. Now, granted, you might live longer, but you, so you add a few, but not that many. And if you're anything like me, you have already used up a whole bunch of those dots. So the question I'm asking myself every week is what do I do with this one dot I have? What do I do with this dot? And I learned two lessons in my life, the two essential questions. The first question is what truly matters? What matters to you? What is it what drives you? What is it what gets you out of bed? What matters to you?
And the second question is, I think, the most important question you can ask yourself. And it's kind of a question you want to ask yourself at the end of your life, and it's out of a poem. And this question is, and did you get out of this life what you wanted? Even so. And even so is important because it acknowledges the fact that life is hard and that it's often throwing stuff in our way which makes it really hard for us to follow. But if you can answer this question with yes when you're on your deathbed, I guarantee you, you have lived a fulfilled life. I work with the U.S. Navy SEALs a little bit, and the U.S. Navy SEALs have a formula, and the formula is this. Your rate of growth, and what they mean is your personal growth, you as an individual, your rate of growth equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by the intensity of the attack. If you believe this to be true, I fundamentally believe this to be true, then the question becomes, why wouldn't you pick the hardest thing you can do and attack it as hard as you possibly can, because that's the way you grow. And what is life other than growth? I want to leave you with the last quote. This is uh, George Bernard Shaw, who's uh, an I Irish playwright. He said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. If I have a wish for you on a very personal basis, we all have to be unreasonable. Because it's the only way we can change this world and we can do to this world what we think we should do and we can create this world in the, in the way we like it. A good friend of mine reminded me about this. He said to me once, the future is a renewable resource and it's very, very hopeful because every day you have a new chance, you get a new way, you get a new shot at creating the future we all desire. So make something out of it. Thank you. <laughs>